said, come on in, we've had a murder. And I asked him for some information. He said, uh, he gave me the address, the 722 North Elm. And it was eerily quiet. And when I went into the den library, first thing I noticed was Jose Menendez seated on the couch. He was uh, slumped to one side, his head was to the one side, but I could immediately tell that his face was disfigured from the shotgun blast that he took to the back of the head. He was wearing shorts and he had a shotgun blast to his thigh, blood soaked, all the way down to the white couch. Hmm. And then I noticed his wife Kitty at his feet on the floor. We didn't see any shotgun shells. Somebody collected the shotgun shells. Somebody that didn't want uh, fingerprints on the shotgun shells, the only thing I could think of. The brothers said they were in and out throughout the day and then as evening approached, they decided that they wanted to go to the movies. They wanted to see a James Bond movie, but it was sold out, so they saw the Batman movie, which uh, they had both seen before. So they decided to see that again. A, a homicide in the valley a few weeks before they were murdered, and Jose mentioned to his sons, you know, this is what happens. This guy was into the pornography business, and he was murdered. They indicated that their father was involved in some shady business contacts. And one in particular was a gentleman by the name of Noel Bloom. Noel Bloom, known for years to law enforcement authorities as a kingpin in the porn trade with alleged ties to East Coast mobsters. You didn't kill Jose Menendez. <laughs> Absolutely not. People had a perception that people in the adult business were organized crime, which is totally not true. At least I had. I was a couple of companies back in New York that uh, I believe was. Jose can be very sweet, smile at you, uh, even charming, but he was very ruthless. He would scream at people. Uh, if he fired, support somebody in his office and fired him, even though he had no business doing so, you would hear him laughing like it was a big joke. I met Kitty several times. She was sometimes going into his office and uh -huh. yelling and screaming and hollering, I mean, really loud. And I think a lot of it was about the kids. You know, they were kind of quiet. They weren't mm -hmm. that friendly, but it seemed like they were a bit troubled. You know, I know they were afraid of him. I saw him just stare them down a couple of times. I got a call from Beverly Hills Police Department. They wanted to meet with me and ask me a few questions. And I said, I've been waiting. He was very cooperative, and we couldn't determine that he had a motive at all. Shotgun killings are very messy, and there were brains and blood everywhere. There was a contact wound on Kitty Menendez's face. It blew out her eye. I mean, it was grotesque what happened to her. A lot of pornography is organized crime backed, because it's a great way to make a lot of money in an industry that's not you know, very well regarded. The number of shots would tell you that it wasn't an organized crime. A friend said, hey, do you remember that guy, Jose Menendez, uh, you know, that you met briefly last week? And I said, sure. And he said, well, he and his wife were blown away last night in Beverly Hills. You know, the family was so close. They were loving. They did everything together. She said, you have to interview Eric and Lyle. And I said, of course, I want to interview Eric and Lyle. The company was getting beaten up in the media because all the media stories were this was a mafia hit, somehow related to shady dealings that this company was doing. Nobody quite knew who had killed the parents. Was it because of Jose's position in business? Or had he been taken out by the mob? It was a big story from the get-go because it happened in Beverly Hills, California. I got a phone call from my brother. And I remember putting the phone down on the table and walking around the house screaming. Several men that worked with Jose talked to me at that memorial service and told me how he loved to humiliate other men. Well, in the first house, they took the old safe. The second house, they got into the safe. Because he was a minor, knowing that Eric probably wouldn't get any jail time. And part of the disposition was that he contact a therapist. In comes Jerry Ozeal. He ordered some of the most expensive shirts I've ever seen in my life. He ordered some jewelry. Order these shoes, these expensive shoes. Um, and I was like, wow. And the way he was spending money for me was very strange. People would ask, you know, people were like, what's he doing? And I would defend him and say, well, everybody reacts differently when somebody dies. This is just his way of coping, I guess. You begin to see a pattern here and you begin to think of greed. I showed up at the Menendez mansion at three in the afternoon and uh, a young woman in her 20s answered the door and she said, oh, Eric and Lyle are out playing tennis. Uh, they'll be back at some point. And immediately in front of me is the room, the room where Jose and Kitty Menendez were killed. And um, I, I had a chill. 
of my spine. I felt creeped out. Eric and Lyle came bouncing in the house wearing tennis whites, looking tan. They were laughing and joking. And I'm kind of torn up inside. I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, I wouldn't be anywhere near this house if my parents had been killed here. Lyle Menendez said, hang on. He said, we don't want to do the interview today. We'd just like to meet you and get to know you. Eric was emotionally appropriate. He would call, he'd cry at times. Um, and he was telling re really lovely stories about how wonderful his parents were. And people were afraid of him. People were afraid of him because he'd walk in the room and know that this man was more powerful. This man was more intelligent. He was going to become senator of Florida. And then he was going to spend his life making Cuba a territory of the United States. Then when he become senator of Florida. And when my brother wants to become president of the United States. They weren't real. They didn't work. Yeah. They, they wax. They looked like wax. It was it's, it's something that I've never seen my dad help us. You know, I think that possibly if Ron and I would have been home, if we would have been able to do something about it, maybe. Uh, maybe my dad would be alive. Uh, I definitely would give my life to my dad. Brothers said that they saw this haze in the air and some smoke that they smelled. I mean, that dissipates pretty darn quick. Well, the officers got there right after they did, and they didn't smell anything. We got a call from Judalon Smith. Her whole purpose was to talk about this doctor and how he was her therapist, and he was having an affair with her. Eric said that they shot their parents. Eric said, I can't kill anymore. And he burst in tears and left. Lyle and Dr. Ozil more or less followed him and Lyle got to the elevator and Dr. Ozil said am I in danger and Lyle said that's all I can tell you is have a good life Dr. Ozil and it freaked him out. Detectives arrested Joseph Lyle Menendez for the August murders of his mother and father. Eric Menendez is being sought by detectives of this department. Judalon said that the guns were purchased at a gun store in San Diego I was looking through gun records, and I said, this is it. Who would imagine that these two young men of privilege, position, and power to be could, could kill their parents? That's, that's the kind of stuff that Shakespeare wrote about. People were not predisposed to think kindly of Eric and Lyle Menendez. Their home at the time was a Tudor-style home. It was on a lake. There were two clear sides of him. One was the very friendly, outgoing, joking person. The flip side was how driven and controlling he was. He would physically come onto the tennis court and start giving instruction to Lyle while I was still there. That was very, very strange, very uncomfortable. He was incredibly quiet, especially when Jose was present. Everyone uh, seemed to look up to them, but not draw closer to them. The minute they would come into a room, they took the era and we were all you know very very careful it was like it was covered with a shield like a, that was impenetrable Alicia remembers more than once seeing Lyle outside her office staring blankly I wish to this day that I had gotten out and said please come in please come in did you talk to Kitty or Jose oh, about this oh no I didn't reveal anything to them no and not anything that could get them in trouble. I think teachers understood deep down inside what they were going through. Like many others, said Alicia, she was careful around Kitty and Jose. But there was one episode she found too disturbing to ignore. A dinner party at the Menendez home. Jose told his guests he brought back VHS tape from a trip to Brazil. And I have to show you guys this because it's so unique. And so he puts it in and I don't remember the name. He said the film showed adults engaging in sex acts in front of children. And we saw a few seconds of it, a few minutes, and we made excuses. A lot of us stood up and said, we have to leave. We couldn't stand to see it, to watch it. But Jose found this engaging. Ah, hysterically funny. I'm hearing a lot of very negative and, and at least heavily psychologically abusive things, but it's not answering what's wrong with this kid because he's incredibly sweet how does he walk into a room with a shotgun this kid and it doesn't add up I mean I'm totally totally puzzled and that's when I bring in Vickery based upon the uh, dozens of parasite cases that, that I had worked on in the past that's the exception that's not the rule the rule is that something horrible is going on in the family 
The main issue, was the Jerome Ozeal confession tape admissible or should doctor-patient privilege keep it out? The arguing went all the way to California's highest court. We sat around for a couple years, waiting for the Supreme Court to rule. During which the Menendez brothers resided at the Men's Central Jail, where, soon after their arrest, Lyle slipped his brother a letter. Dateline obtained a copy, it's never been broadcast before. In it, Lyle wrote about their father and the murders. He bore two brilliant children, only two. They carry his name and his pride. We did not do anything for the money. He went on. We alone know the truth. We alone know the secrets of our family's past. I do not look forward to broadcasting them around the country. I pray that it never has to happen. Secrets? At this point, even attorney Leslie Abramson knew none of them. Lyle and Eric revealed nothing. Not to Abramson and not to the forensic psychiatrist she hired, William Vickery. What struck me in that initial interview was how together the older brother Lyle was. I mean, he was articulate, he made good eye contact, mm -hmm. he had very thoughtful, organized answers. Eric, on the other hand, seemed broken. He very rarely made eye contact. He was biting his fingernails. So I was thinking in my head, boy, I sure hope I get to work with the older brother and not the younger brother because this is going to be a piece of cake with the older brother. And the minute something would leak out about maybe things weren't so wonderful in the family, he would start crying. And he would kind of dissolve and, and, and whimper and he just wouldn't go any further. <sighs> Vickery put Eric on antidepressants and slowly a trust began to form. As the months rolled by, I got more and more pieces of information, and it got worse and worse and worse as to what was going on in this family, until finally the dam broke. Eric and Lyle's cousin, Alan Anderson, had lived with the Menendez family and knew the public didn't understand. They just knew that, okay, we got these rich kids, boom, shot their parents, now they think they're multimillionaires. Well, that's not the case. I've heard them being whipped. Oh, man, it was gut-wrenching. Just the, the screams. And the daddy, don't hit me, daddy, don't, you know, that kind of stuff. He would take their heads and push them underwater until they started panicking and needed up. He would let them up again. I mean, if Jose did it or said it, there was no questioning it. Absolutely none. Not by the boys, not by Kitty. She became like his right-hand man in enforcing things. Including what Diane and Alan came to know as the single most important rule in the Menendez house. You cannot go down the hall when Jose's with his kids. Kitty really? didn't go down the hall either? No, no, uh-uh. Three of them would take showers together. Uh, Lyle was 15 and Eric was 12. If my daughter needed me to lie for her, I'd lie for her. Yeah. If it was a life and death thing, of course you would. If it's your cousin that you grew up with, of course you would. A relative came to me and said that she felt that the um, defense was made up, that she confronted Lyle about it, and he said to her, that's the way it's going to be. Did the brothers ask you to lie for them? No. Did they ask you to sort of like shade things or tell mm -hmm. certain stories and not other stories mm -hmm. or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The idea that there was a camera in a courtroom in California was so new, so novel, you weren't just playing to the jury, you were playing to all of America. In basic English, the prosecution's case was this, just the facts, ma'am. Why are you using the fake ID? Because you know you're going to be using the gun to do something you shouldn't be doing. That is evidence of intent. At the end of the prosecution case, I was like, okay, these, these two brothers are so guilty, it's not even funny. The parents were as much on trial as Lyle and Eric Menendez were on trial. And, and while the prosecution tried to, to stick to a just the facts, ma'am narrative, the defense strategy was emotion, 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 emotion. You either totally believe that the brothers had been abused, or no, you thought the whole thing was a complete crock of you-know-what. That's what the defense wanted everybody to hear, these, these boys, boys. And these poor boys, these <laughs> orphans. Yeah. They were very aggressive about spending money as soon as possible. We had a joke, um, the investigator, myself, and my co-counsel, uh, co Lester, the joke was, you have a gun, you have two bullets, you go in the courtroom, who do you shoot, okay? <laughs> so both the guys say they would shoot Lyle and Eric. And I, my thing was, I'm gonna shoot Leslie twice. I felt that the brothers were evil, but not as bad as she was. Under all the circumstances, it was reasonable to the person to think that they were acting in self-defense, but the reality is that that wasn't the case at all. They came to believe that something terrible was about to break loose. What do you believe was the originating cause 
of you and your brother ultimately winding up shooting your parents? Me telling Lyle that, uh... You telling Lyle what? Was it you telling Lyle about something that was happening? My dad... My dad had been molesting me. I told him I would tell everybody everything about him. I would tell the police and that I would tell the family. He said, we all make choices in life, son. Eric made his, and you've made yours. I thought we were in danger. So what did you do? I ran upstairs to tell my brother that it was happening now. At some point, was your gun empty? Yes. I could see somebody uh, moving, <laughs> seemed like moving in the direction of where my brother should be. And what did you do after you reloaded? I ran around, shot my mom. When you put the shotgun up against her left cheek and you pulled the trigger, did you love your mother? Yes. And was that an act of love, Mr. Menendez? It was confusion, fear. You were afraid of her at that point? They slaughtered their mother in a way that was so cruel, she got up to run and they went out and they reloaded and they put the gun up to her cheek and blew her brains out. I'm sorry, that is the height of cruelty. They offered their mental state as a defense and when you offer your mental state as a defense you have waived your psychiatric patient privilege. We made a mistake right off the bat. Hazel Thornton was on Eric's jury. We took a show of hands as to what level of guilt we uh -huh. thought they were and it became immediate that it was men against women murder versus man manslaughter. The public thinks that the women were emotional in the trial it was the men who were emotional. They pounded their fists on the table, they called us names, they yelled at us. Mr. Garcetti was very upset about the fact that we couldn't win the big one. Yeah. And when O.J. Simpson went home at the end of his trial, it was very hard in the DA's office. We were, you know, nationally considered to be kind of losers. It's one thing that we have asked the judge to do is to limit the so-called abuse excuse. I was shocked. I said, well, they've gutted the defense. I mean, the, the, there, there is no defense without that. The uh, approach that the prosecutor, David Kahn, took was to attack at every, at every turn and not give any free uh, passes there. At the time, the defense attorney was saying this was a family that was win at all costs, the ends justify the means. To say that their parents had abused them was almost like the ends justified the means. Let's make up this story about abuse. I miss just having people around. I miss not having my dog around, like it makes a gross amount. Mm -hmm. That really just was like a punch in the gut. Do you think, in retrospect, had you been offered imperfect self-defense, that you might have maybe started in a different place or come to a different conclusion? I'm pretty confident that we would not have because we literally started from first degree murder and when every element was satisfied, we were done. It's a tale of two trials. The trials couldn't have been more different. Cliff Gardner was the attorney appointed to handle Lyle's appeal. So it was sort of a one, two, three punch. No source evidence, no lay, no expert mm -hmm. testimony, and then your defense doesn't go to the jury. In this never before broadcast audio of Lyle's federal appeal hearing. A judge also questioned why so many key rulings changed in trial number two. A little distasteful that when the state doesn't succeed in convicting somebody under one set of rules, it sort of changes the rules dramatically. My father's raped, I said no. And I just feel like part of that pact I have with my dad is I'm keeping this secret. And for you to have done this to my brother it was like, I kept my part of that sort of devil's pack, and you didn't, you know, and, and my mother just, you know, you let your children wake up in the home of a child molester every day? My mother was very cruel, uh, I believe. She just very much resented uh, my brother and I from early, early on. I would trade my entire defense for a 30-second video of my father uh, raping me. I, I would trade my whole case for it, because I think it's so sanitized and so easy to use the word abuse, oh, abuse, the abuse wasn't so bad. Uh, we didn't decide to do it. Uh, it was, uh, we finally uh, just kind of got overwhelmed with this panic and emotion and, and made the decision to, to run in that room. I'd have to say, keep it. there's, you know, it's just not really entirely accurate. I didn't have a California ID, so there was no way to purchase a weapon uh, other than my brother using this other kid's ID. I certainly, in the room, wasn't making kind of decisions in a chaotic situation like that, but... You know, reflecting afterwards, you know, uh, it haunts me. It, it does haunt me. The 
a, a person like my father is not going to allow you to just take something that will ruin his life that he has so carefully crafted. He's not going to. He's not going to. But leave and do what? Leave and just wait for yourself to be killed in a parking lot? I mean, <laughs> I don't think... Uh, I was going to tell the Beverly Hills Police Department that, uh, you know, I killed my parents and here's why, and they were going to go, okay, go back home. So uh, this self-preservation at that point, this case should have been settled. Uh, there are like two, two to three hundred parasite cases a year where a parent is killed by a child, and they are almost all related to abuse, and they are almost all settled. This case, they picked out as different. Exactly. And I think that it was very easy because it was Beverly Hills, my father had a lot of money, to sort of sell this headline that, these brothers killed for money. I don't think yep. it matters how big the home is, how big the lawn is, how well dressed you are. Um, you know, I, I think that's one of the myths that we fought in this trial in the early 90s. Is that it seems like perfect family. Well, that's I, it really is that. not behind the walls. You know, yeah. I think we've learned that in uh, just our culture today. Watching Real Housewives and other shows, reality TV, getting into the homes of people who are privileged and realizing that they're just as screwed up as uh, uh, problems other people are having. I, I didn't blank it out, but I don't because I, I I know for sure I didn't blank it out because it still wakes me up in my sleep. Uh, it was dark, and as soon as you start firing, it's also just an explosion of gun residue in your face and in this in this small room, mm -hmm. and there is no is chaos chaos. You don't know, you're not even really sure you know what you're shooting uh, at. I mean, I just you just shoot in the direct. I, I I just burst in it, so I don't have really. You know, I can't really help uh, describe it. My brother was telling me, we need to tell what happened yeah. uh, and say why this happened. And I was like, well, why is that, why is that relevant? Mm -hmm. Let's keep that out. And I told him, look, okay, you can do this, and you can talk about what happened, but you will still be convicted, and you will still be in jail when it's over. Watch. And it will, it will not have mattered. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, I was right in that he's still in jail, but I think I was wrong in that it didn't matter. Because so many people write me about being helped by seeing that finally told in a public way, that kind of uh, sexual abuse. It is important for this to continue to be out there and talked about. I know it's going to be uh, a, a suffering for me, but I feel like uh, I can find some purpose here.